Corby, uh, this is Rob Perlberg. I'm greeting you from my uh, kitchen here in Watertown, Massachusetts. It's nice to meet you, at least uh, electronically. I should start by, by introducing myself. I'm a professor of political science at Wellesley College nearby, and I don't claim to be an expert on food um, like you. I'm a specialist on food and agricultural policy and politics. I've worked in a number of different countries, most recently in Africa. And my publisher, Oxford University Press, set up this conversation in hopes of uh, publicizing a book that I published just last month. It's titled Food Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know. And uh, let me hold up a, a copy and see if the camera can catch it. Uh, this is a, a book that Oxford asked me to write. I said, well, what do you want it to cover? And they said, everything. Everything from, from famine to obesity. Everything from agroecology to agribusiness. They said they wanted me to describe the, the political landscape in food and agriculture. Who has power and who doesn't. Uh, they said they wanted me to speak truth to power. I said, well, it's sometimes dangerous simply to speak truth about power, but uh, but I'll do my best. I hope they've sent you a copy of the book, and uh, it'll be fun uh, listening to your reactions and, and your questions and your thoughts. So well, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. I'm Corby Kummer, an editor at the Atlantic Monthly and the editor of our website, the Food Channel at theatlantic.com. Because so much of the Food Channel is devoted to issues of sustainability, and because we have um, our own blogger of Marion Nessel, who wrote a book called, and I'm cheating by holding this up to the camera, called Food Politics, um, they thought, of course, I should be doing something about food politics. So we have a new book called Food Politics, and I will be fair and hold the cover up. Uh, by Rob Parberg, who's with me from Watertown, Mass. And I was going to be in my kitchen too, so, uh, we should have both done, we should have both done kitchen dialogues. Um, so. A kitchen debate. Very, I have, I um, have, I'm it, just reminded of the kitchen debate that Richard Nixon had with, uh, Prime Minister Khrushchev back in 1959. You know, I don't have a shoe that I can wrap <laughs> on the table. But, Good. Uh, but soon it will come. So in your introduction, you talk about food policy and food politics being a world of irreconcilable differences. And, and you lay so many of them out really extremely well, uh, particularly when it comes to matters of market and pricing, uh, definition of hunger and poverty and the difference, stuff I didn't realize, and the political causes of famine. I've read a lot about the political causes of famine, but never as succinctly and broadly as you do. This is That's a chapter everybody should read. It should be required reading like a lot of this book. And in other areas, particularly the use of inputs like synthetic nitrogen, use for fertilizer, use of technology in farming, and agroecology, which is kind of the wisdom of the ages and traditional small-scale farming, versus scientific farming and all the advances it's made in the so-called green revolutions, you do lay out differences, but, you know, you sometimes take on something of a condescending tone. It's confusing after so much of the helpful neutrality elsewhere. So it kind of amounts to, I can't figure out where you're coming from. Was that deliberate or like all very bright people, you have conflicting points of view on many of the same things or because the publisher said, just give us a straight overview? Well, I, I, when it comes to the agricultural technology issues, I, I do admit that I've, uh, I've become a bit impatient with the, the culture that, that I encountered here in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, the notion that the only sustainable food system is uh, an, organic, an organic food system. In fact, a local organic food system. I don't think there's evidence to support that scientifically. And so I think you're, you're smart. You've detected uh, an edge uh, in my tone when I get to those issues. Doesn't and, take that much. There's an edge in this. <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, I'm prepared to uh, to 
address these issues on the merits. Um, I can start with organic food. A lot of people don't know the history of um, organic farming. It's an approach to farming that was originally named biodynamic farming, and it was developed in Austria in the early 20th century, not by an environment... By Rudolf Steiner? Uh, Rudolf Steiner. It was developed not by an environmentalist, uh, but by a mystic who uh, was opposed to uh, synthetic nitrogen. He believed that living things could only be nurtured by the products of other living things, such as manure from from animals. Uh, he also believed in human reincarnation in the lost city of Atlantis. Uh, this is an approach to farming. But, but does it mean they all have to go That's together? true, There's that's lots true. lots of principles of biodynamic farming that people embrace, principally replenishment of soil as the most important task of a farmer. Well, uh, you know, you can, you can, if you spend all of your time growing soil, you're going to make the food that the soil produces far less abundant and far per, per hour of effort and per dollar of effort. Um, there's, um, no, I know that the British Soils Association says that there's nothing more important than the amount of organic matter in the soil, but I'm enough of an economist to want the, the production of food to be somewhere there in the equation and the the labor investments and the resource investments that organic farmers need uh, to replenish soil nitrogen without using synthetic nitrogen, using only cover crops and crop rotations and composted animal manure, uh, those investments are extremely expensive, which is why organic produce uh, is is so much more expensive than conventionally grown. You know, and they're and they're labor intensive. There's so much that I grant you in this book, which is that there's got to be a medium between um, focusing only on replenishing soil and um, actually producing enough to feed your own economy. As it happens, I got off the plane last night from a meeting with the head of with Patrick Holden, whom I think is a, a real visionary and the head of the British Soil Association, which has some offshoots here. So, yes, I am. I, they asked us to be on opposing sides. I'm certainly on the side of the Soil Association. But I also agree with you that you can't prescribe one mode when uh, you have to feed a lot of people. And you're very careful about that in the book. Something that you say that I found provocative, one of many provocative things you say in your new food politics, um, what you need to know, is that um, synthetic nitrogen in combination with no-till methods and a lot of methods that we think of as, as sustainable are the best ways of replenishing soil. I, I find that really interesting because, you know, someone like Patrick Holden at the Soil Association would say, no, it's always wrong, always wrong to add synthetic nitrogen. So could you explain that? You, you, the, the book is very much written as a textbook with short, it's, a, it's sort of a Socratic method of one, you posing questions and then answering questions. So you don't have time to go into everything and so many of your summaries are really beautifully succinct. But you don't really expand that idea of why synthetic nitrogen works so well in combination with traditional methods to replenish soil. Well, the traditional methods, uh, composted uh, animal manure, uh, planting legumes in crop rotations, um, plowing under green manure, those traditional methods deliver a lot of good uh, benefits to the soil other than nitrogen. But they're not uh, as uh, effective at delivering soluble nitrogen. So they need to be supplemented with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer applications. Not nearly the quantity of synthetic nitrogen that's in use in the United States and Europe and, God forbid, China or Japan, where it's badly overused and it pollutes water systems. We use much too much synthetic mm -hmm. nitrogen in the United States. That's one reason uh, mm -hmm. even before the uh, even before the current oil spill in the Gulf, there was a dead zone caused by too much synthetic nitrogen runoff down the Mississippi River. All yeah. down the Mississippi. Yeah, you're but the, but the, the solution to that problem is 
not to embrace an organic standard that requires you to cut synthetic nitrogen applications to zero, the solution is to reduce synthetic nitrogen applications significantly by regulation, by taxation, by reduced farm subsidies, and to use and to increase the use of organic methods, but to combine and integrate the two rather than adopting a rigid organic certification standard that Okay, great. You, you've, you've brought something, something up that I wanted to say because you in fact lay the blame for a lot of these excessive nitrogen applications to farm subsidies really all over the world, but especially in the United States that have made it really cheap and easy to add all this. And you've just said sort of magic words that I didn't expect you to say, regulation and taxation. Um, but who's going to decide the level? So I understand why you're against these universal organic abolish it all. Um, laws that we now have because you think that they're unrealistic and not really sustainable over the long term economically. But who's going to decide what the proper level of synthetic nitrogen is? And do you think there's, that there should be a global standard? I don't think there should be a, a global standard. Um, it should be less than we're now using in advanced industrial societies. I mean, in the East mm -hmm. Asian countries, they use sometimes more than 200 kilograms per hectare. The United States average is less than that, but it's well over 100 kilograms. We should cut that down dramatically. But in Africa, where the current level is only 9 kilograms per hectare, they should increase. Africa should be using much more synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And, and will you assure me, since um, I'm not armed with the facts and figures you are, that even over the long term, this isn't going to cause like huge problems in exhausting the soil the way critics in India like Vandana, Shiva, and you use celebrity in the most deprecatory way in your book, celebrity activist. Uh, Michael Pollan is a celebrity food writer. Thank God I'm not in there as a celebrity food writer. Um, and I liked your respect for my friend Eric Schlosser as a journalist, which he is. He's a very serious journalist. Um, but when, when, when people in India, not just Vandana Shiva, talk about the terrible, and South Asia, talk about the terrible damage that nitrogen has done to soil over the long run, you, I, I imagine, don't disagree with that. You just think that there is a medium that with lower levels of synthetic nitrogen, there can be long-term health for the soil. Are, are there studies to back that up? Uh, I, I think Vandana Shiva is on the wrong track. Uh, she embraces organic farming. She embraces the use of traditional seed varieties, pre-Green Revolution varieties. It's fascinating. She's not just opposed to genetic engineering. She's opposed to the original Green Revolution in India. Um, She's not alone. Well, uh, she's not alone, but if you ask farmers in India, if you ask public policy officials in India, if you ask people who run India's food and agricultural system, they uh, embrace it as a continuing success. It was, first of all, a success in poverty reduction. Before the Green Revolution, poverty levels in the Indian countryside were at 62%. Now they're down to 27%. By allowing small farmers in India to become more productive, by giving them seeds that could be used in combination with irrigated uh, systems and fertilizer to sometimes double or triple yields, giving them access to those technologies, increase the productivity of their labor, increase their income dramatically, it not only brought... There's no question about these fabulous results. It's at, it's at what long-term cost, no? Well, uh, yields in India continue to go up. Now, the, the long-term concern in India isn't with fertilizer applications. It's with the depletion of groundwater from pumping too much water. But that can be corrected, and this is back to something we were talking about earlier, by removing subsidies. Mm -hmm. In India, farmers are now politically powerful enough to demand from their government artificially cheap electricity for running irrig irrigation pumps. So they mm -hmm. pump uh, more water than market signals alone would, uh, would induce them to pump. And that is leading to a dramatic drop in groundwater levels in some of the most productive parts of India. And that's called into question the sustainability of current farming practices. But 
This, sure, right. But the solution like that. to that problem isn't to go back to uh, the varieties that were planted before 1965. Uh, the solution to that problem is a sensible public policy, one that halts the subsidization of groundwater pumping. Well, uh, that brings up two big questions, which is your view on subsidies and whether they should just be abolished, which I'm really interested in, um, because you're so good on who has power and thus who can get subsidies. So small groups have a better chance of power than large groups because there's a larger quota of self-interest that will accrue to them. Uh, as political movements, so the small number of consolidated big farmers in the United States uh, have the best chance of winning these huge subsidies that are pretty much universally unpopular with everybody I know, and even with George W. Bush, our friend. Um, and small commodities like sugar can do even better than huge commodities like soybeans because there's fewer of them, so they can... Uh, come together in a more united, focused way and get more individual benefits for themselves. And same thing in India. But in Africa, say, nobody on the land has any power. So who should decide? Should, should these kind of subsidies you're talking about, which seem almost universally to have a distorting effect, be abolished? And who should be deciding, you know, who gets the money for, um, for the, the use of these new technologies that you really advocate. And then we're going to get to whether those, whether those seeds, which are initially given as, as donations, then turn proprietary and turn into huge, ugly devils, even though they start out as wonderful, charitable friends. But let's start with subsidies. Yeah, well, you, you've described the situation very well. Uh, in, in poor developing countries, for example, for example, countries in Africa, the farmers tend to be politically weak. The typical farmer is a woman who cannot read or write in mm -hmm. any language, who lives uh, 30 minutes from the nearest all-weather road, is cut off politically from uh, her government, has no political voice, um, so it's very easy for politicians in the capital city to ignore her needs. The powerful people are the urban dwellers who are close to uh, the rulers. They are the ones who can cause trouble for the government, whether it's the urban bureaucracy or the army or the police or industrialists or students. And so the, the city has political power, and the way to keep the city happy is to keep food prices artificially low. That means purchasing food from farmers at an artificially low price and delivering it. You know, it to that is so good because dollars. Carla Petrini, the head of Slow Food, and, you know, one of those elitists who speaks for the farmers he isn't one of that you're so um, happy to disparage, uh, is always talking about the terrible move from the farm to the city in developing countries and how devastating that is to local communities, which is something I believe heartily. I may not live in a tiny farming community in Latin America or Africa, but I believe in their survival, uh, moving to the cities. But it's not just the devastating effect of industries that are trying to take over farms down there and agro-industry. You point out very clearly and well how much it's a fact that governments have been favoring the urban uh, voters, really, because they're the ones who vote, and they're the ones who have the power to keep them in office. By keeping um, prices of food in the city artificially low and making it unaffordable, thus leading to those terrible statistics we read about 60% and 70% of farmers in Latin America and Africa being unable to feed themselves. So it gives them incentive, doesn't yes, it, to and, abandon and, farms and move to cities? Absolutely. Uh, farming is women's work in Africa primarily because it pays so little, only about a dollar a day. So men who can, who are a little more mobile, often just after they do the heavy work of field preparation and maintaining the terraces, they'll leave and look for work in, in, in market towns or in urban centers. But it's not just the price relationships. Governments in Africa, to please urban populations, invest most of their public resources, not in agriculture, but in other parts of the economy. 
In Africa, more than 60% of all citizens get their income from agriculture and from herding animals, and yet typically governments in Africa spend only about 5% of their budget on the Because they don't have incentive so to get early. votes, right? Uh, yeah, they don't have to worry about being overthrown by uh, by the remote, uh, disorganized mm -hmm. rural poor. They have to worry about uh, urban groups. Now, of course, in industrial countries, curiously, it's just the other way around. In Europe, in Japan, in the United States, farmers aren't 60% of the population. They're only 6%. Or in the U.S., 2%. And yet they are um, very well organized politically. They're wealthy. Uh, they have access to institutions inside their governments in the United States. It's the agriculture mm -hmm. committees of the House and the Senate. And they are in a position to make demands from their government for for subsidies. And the subsidies can become phenomenally expensive. The last farm bill passed in the United States in 2008 cost $270 billion over five years. So in developed countries, uh, policies tend to be rural biased rather than urban biased, and they, they generate a different kind of... Um, Let's go back to Africa and the idea that governments have no incentive to help farmers realize better yields because they're not depending on them for power. Uh, and the idea that you're, you're quite upset that because of a kind of uh, worldwide movement against and reaction against technology, um, research has, has been effectively halted or very much slowed in a kind of second green revolution that many advocates in Africa and many foundations are calling for. And people like Vandana Shiva, on the one hand, are trying to discredit the idea of a green revolution and sweeping in with technology that can be devastating uh, for rural populations, um, as opposed to you and others who say, look, give these people a crack at feeding themselves and helping them out with drought-resistant seeds, which is what is needed in Africa. My question is, and I absolutely don't have the answer, and I don't know that you do, is, yes, yeah, say that the Gates Foundation and others um, fund research into GMOs that will be drought-resistant seeds, and do, and that large corporations like Monsanto and DuPont do give these away to the farmers. They don't charge them. They still do have patents on them because, of course, they've got to protect the investment they've made into the research. And at any moment, they can say, you've had your free doses of heroin and now it's time to start paying. And they've completely taken hostage to all these farmers. So that's the view of me and a lot of my liberal friends. Um, you know, oh, I've dropped my... Bluetooth. So that's the view of me and a lot of my liberal friends. What guarantee do we have that those companies are going to, you know, and the foundations will continue to supply these seeds free? Well, the the patents on these seeds uh, are taken out only in countries where patent law permits that kind of intellectual property mm -hmm. rights claim. Patent law in the United States and in Canada allows companies like Monsanto to, to patent their genetically engineered technologies. But patent laws in most of the rest of the world, including virtually the entire developing world, don't allow those kinds of, of property claims on living things like plants. So it's not legally possible for private companies to patent seeds in African but it doesn't mean that they're going to so keep giving them away for free. They have every right to charge for them. Uh, they have, uh, well, they don't have a right to charge for them. Once the seeds are in the hands of African farmers, those farmers can replicate and replant the seeds as often as they like uh, beyond any legal interference from the private company because they're doing it in Africa where there aren't any patent laws that apply rather than in the United States or in Canada, where the patent mm -hmm. laws do apply. Uh, now, you might say, well, why are the private companies uh, spending any time at all in Africa giving these seeds away under those circumstances? And uh, the reason is that they're, they're not losing any commercial markets 
in Africa because African farmers don't have they don't have the purchasing power to be good customers. But they do have the, they do have so, the purchasing power eventually. Aren't there inputs that are still going to be required for the successful use of these seeds? Inputs, uh, you know, nitrogen and fertilizers and and herbicides are going to cost a lot of money. Well, uh, yes, they'll cost money, but in combination with let's step back now for a second and go to some technologies that are currently available for African farmers. The genetically engineered seeds haven't yet been developed for those farmers except for one or two crops, so it's not a widely available yeah. option. But hybrid maize seeds, which are not genetically engineered, and conventional nitrogen fertilizer, fertilizer applications, those two things in combination can increase maize yields in Africa from one ton per hectare up to four or five tons per hectare. There aren't any intellectual property claims at all on any of those technologies. They've been on the shelf for a long time. Uh, if you were to stimulate the uptake of those technologies, farmers in Africa might spend a little bit more on fertilizer. They might spend a little bit more on hybrid seeds, but they would get such a yield benefit that in the end their own income would increase significantly. That's been the experience of farmers in Asia. That's been the experience of Farmers that have escaped poverty ever, everywhere else, and the, the hope is that you could stimulate that same, same kind of uh, technology uptake in, in Africa. And that wouldn't have to be done by private companies. That can be done through, um, through public sector research and extension. I, I have to say that I, I, I worry a lot about your constant emphasis on yield and the yield improvements of the green revolution of these improved seeds. It's completely understandable that they've had enormous beneficial effects in, in feeding more people faster and indeed in saving land from deforestation that would otherwise have to be cleared for rural farming, for farming to feed people. You're, you're you know, good on that and that's unarguable. But when you talk about yields, you also leave out uh, part of the whole equation that people like uh, Petrini and as Slow Food and others are always mentioning, which is the effect of communities. So say that small farmers... Hello, we've lost. What's happening? Uh, I think we're back. I think that was someone calling in early who's now hung up. It sounds like Phil. Phil, are you telling us something we should know? We just thought we heard your voice on the conference call. No. Okay, let's pick up where we were. So, uh, yeah, back to uh, <laughs> back to you. Still running, right? Yeah, we're still running. Okay. When you talk about yields and your emphasis on yields, it's unarguable the effects they've had on feeding many more people. Um, using less land to feed more people, less land that might otherwise have to be cleared, uh, deforested, that, hurt, that hurts the ecosystem. But you also ignore the effect it can have on communities, on communities that were interdependent, on communities that had languages, that had cultures that get lost as farming gets consolidated and the few people who are somehow given the resources to be able to realize these yields uh, keep doing them and that other farmers are sort of priced out of the market. So th there's also there's a human and social cost to these yields that it, it seems to me you're, um, you're leaving out uh, a lot throughout the book. Well, okay. This is a. I mean, this is something we can have a long discussion. Do summarize about. it, please. And I don't think we're. Well, I, I don't think we're that far apart. I think yields have mm -hmm. to increase. If you go back to where yields were in India before the Green Revolution, the country was on the brink of famine. I mean, food was slow, and there were rural communities, but they were impoverished and seriously malnourished. I don't want to make yield everything. I don't want to have a single style of agriculture driven by um, the most recent varieties, the most sophisticated combination of inputs, and the highest yield per hectare. But if you have some of that, you're going to generate enough wealth to permit the, the protection and preservation out of consumer choice and out of the emergence of movements like the slow food movement. 
you're going to be able to preserve and protect uh, traditional varieties, heirloom varieties, uh, food cultures, gastronomic traditions. I mean, this is what we're seeing in, in Europe today. Europe has, uh, has some of the highest cereal yields in the world because they use even more nitrogen fertilizer than the United States. They have a far more intensive farming system than the United States. But they are also mindful of their food history, their food culture, and through social movements like Slow Food, they are celebrating and preserving those things. So I think you can have, I think you can have both at the same time. You could, I, I once wrote an essay with a friend uh, named David Orden, which predicted that the 21st century would be the century of multi-agriculturalism. It would be not just one style of farming, it would be multiple styles of farming. And those choices become available uh, only after you have uh, escaped the, uh, the destitution of low-yield farming. You know, I completely understand board. that point. And there's certainly an argument to be made that the reason Europeans can afford to be so careful about preserving their heritage is they've been given all these resources and tools with higher yielding seeds uh, that they can feed themselves with relative ease and so they can then go back to the delightful task of preserving heirloom seeds and you know all these quaint sewing traditions we don't and craft traditions that we we don't want to die out but just as you draw a distinction in the book that is really good and again like the chapter on politics and famine everybody should read um it's about the difference between hunger and poverty and how hunger is defined and you think defined by many leading world organizations insufficiently based on estimates that are much too broadly calculated and that has to be done on a much more individual basis i really respect that and think again everybody should be aware of these distinctions but a distinction i not i don't see you make is when you just talked about when you were defending yield the idea that these people are now poor you know they're too poor to be able to have the luxury of preserving their cultures or or wanting to i, I also think that we are imposing our definition of poor on developing world communities that themselves, and here I am again, the urban Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts liberal, uh, romanticizing these small communities, but they've survived very well for hundreds of years in systems they have developed, uh, and that introducing some big new component that really disrupts that system, I think has long-term effects and distorting effects on those communities whose heritage and culture still exist. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, these cultures are being disrupted by external influence, but the introduction of more productive agricultural techniques was not the first disturbance. In the case of of uh -huh. Africa. Uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s, international donors and the, uh, the World Health Organization and UNICEF introduced um, inoculations against childhood disease, basic public health, clean water systems, oral rehydration for diarrheal disease. These things, thank goodness, brought down infant mortality rates dramatically. Traditional African communities uh, had to live with the fact that large numbers of children died before the age of mm -hmm. five. Through external interventions, those uh, infant mortality rates were reduced dramatically. The result, however, of that wonderful achievement was a rate of population growth in Africa that had never been seen before. That population growth rate threatened to overwhelm traditional agricultural systems. The traditional agricultural system in Africa, uh, which worked well with sparse populations, was to uh, cut down uh, the bush, burn it, uh, and farm a piece of land for a season or two, and then uh, return it to, to fallow for 10 years or 15 years. 
to let the soil nutrients be restored. That kind of shifting cultivation system worked when you had sparse population. But once population growth rates took off, once population density increased, that system didn't work anymore. It resulted in too much forest being cut, too much expansion of low-yield farming. It was doing environmental devastation. Wildlife habitats were being destroyed. At that point, what African farmers needed was another uh, introduction of something new, that is ways to increase yields on lands that have already been cleared, ways of replacing soil nutrients without having to leave the land fallow. And, and without, without depleting so the soil, right? I mean, it depends a lot on what these right. methods are. And they, they haven't worked out for everyone, which makes me rudely interrupt because you're awfully, um, you're awfully keen on, um, well, first of all, I have to give, I have to say I really agree with that argument about needing to feed a larger population health advances have made possible. Um, and, and we have to find ways that are respectful of the Africans. And in this case, it would be drought resistant seeds, right? Not things that require inputs of water and nitrogen that only ruin land. We both agree on that. Um, but you're awfully defensive in the book. And this is where I, I most disagree with you. You're so balanced in most of um, food politics, what you need to know. But then at the end, you kind of, for sport, it seems to me, take on uh, people like me who like organic and local and don't think about the larger populations in Africa that have to be fed without um, clear clearing land that isn't suited for agricultural purposes. Uh, this kind of romantic notion that these markets can be sustainable economically when they're they're not. They require too much land and too much time and too much labor. Um, but you also think that... Uh, Roundup Ready, I have to say, has been has been a, a very good thing, and I have to hold up the headline that's the number one most um, read story on the Times, which is uh, "Farmers Cope with Roundup Resistant Weeds." You you scant very much. I noticed you kind of cherry pick evidence. If I can, uh, if I can be a little, if I can uh, talk a little a bit in an inflammatory way. It strikes Go me that you, you cherry pick evidence about defending genetically engineered and GMOs when you talk about all their benefits and say there hasn't been convincing evidence that they can really disrupt systems in the long run. Whereas things like giant ragweed and horseweed that farmers who've been using Roundup Ready can't control and the state of Arkansas is calling the biggest reverse in agriculture in decades – they don't seem like a good thing, and they do seem like the kind of unanticipated consequences that alarmists like us have been warning of for years. Well, okay, in the case of weeds resistant to the herbicide um, glyphosate, which is which is Roundup, yep. it's no longer in patent, so anyone can manufacture it and sell it. Sure. Uh, resistance to herbicides in the weed population and resistance pesticides in the pest population has always been a problem with conventional agriculture. It's not specific to genetic engineering. The use of Roundup is associated with the use of Roundup ready crops that are genetically engineered, but the problem of resistance to chemicals is not uh, associated specifically with genetic engineering. It's a much, much larger problem. But when farmers become dependent on monocultures that have been so wonderfully high-yielding for them and suddenly they run into this giant problem, it's not the problem it was in the past. It's gigantic and insoluble. Well, we'll, we'll see how big it is. Currently, about 5% of soybean acres are seeing the emergence of these resistant weeds. Now, in traditional agricultural science, you always have to make research investments to stay ahead of resistance problems, whether it's pest resistance or weed resistance. And uh, the private companies, believe me, since they want to protect their market for these seeds, are looking for ways now to uh, for new weed control packages that will allow the technology to continue operating. They're making investments in stacking additional genes into the soybeans that will be resistant to slightly different chemicals that will kill the weeds without killing the soybeans. But it does seem like it's, you're always keeping one step ahead of the unanticipated, and then, then the unanticipated comes and clobbers you in a, in a new, horrible uh, way. Well, 
uh, well, that, you know, uh, the, that's why investments in agricultural science are so important. Our world is much better fed today than ever before. You know, you mentioned my famine chapter. Fortunately, that's mostly a history chapter now. We don't have famines in the 21st century. We haven't had any yet. But you've uh, also said it has, it has well, that's century. a wonderful chapter about famine, but you've also said it's been, it's never been really a problem of actual food production. It's been political policies, unelected, tyrannical governments that have imposed them. So I'm not sure how these increased yields have actually helped decrease famines rather than uh, you know, the spread of more democratic governments and uh, more powerful people who can pressure governments not to make these famine-inducing policies, no? Uh, well, if you want to go back uh, to the yields that wheat farmers in India were getting in, in 1964 before the Green Revolution, you're going to have to accept the famine threat that India faced at that time, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But the great famine you talk about in Bengal was the British colonialists who were too busy uh, investing in weapons <laughs> for World War II to bother about the colony, right? Yeah, you read the book carefully. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not famines have, have many different causes, and you're you're exactly right. Uh, high yields aren't going to and didn't solve the famine crisis, but if we get rid of high yields, risks of famine will will increase, uh, in, especially in developing countries. Well, I have to say it sounds like you're trying to have it both ways because so often you talk about um, food crises and how food crises are way, way overblown by the press and way overreported. For example, the 2008 so-called global food crisis was mostly a factor of market bubbles that were going – there are always going to be fluctuations and spikes in commodity prices and there was no need to have this panic buying. It subsided when the market returned to a more normal point in its inevitable cycle. So you really talk about politics and economics, and I have to say in a very useful way, in a helpful way that I think very much recommends this book, um, as being the real causes rather than actual lacks of food. So I, I, then that gives the wedge to me and my unrealistic, romantic, liberal activist friends to say, okay, it hasn't been a question of lack of food, so let's try to preserve these local communities that have been growing in very local ways and um, use agroeconomy in place of um, technology that can, that can backfire. And I understand that you think that that is a very backward, progress-stifling um, point of view, no? Um. I want farmers to have the choice. I want farmers to have the choice of, of uh, the technology that, that suits their purposes and their needs. I want them to have access to hybrid seeds and to, to fertilizers. Um, and if it works for them, uh, I don't want to take that away. Now, what that sometimes means is that uh, donors have to make some investments in in agricultural research, because all agricultural science is local. You can't take a high-yielding uh, maize variety that's been developed in Iowa and grow it in a tropical country like Tanzania. You would need agricultural research in Tanzania. I think, unfortunately, criticism of high yields has cut down on the contributions donor countries are willing to make to agricultural research in countries like Tanzania. The United States, between 1980 and 2006 reduced its assistance to agricultural science in Africa by more than 70%. That has stopped African scientists from developing the, the variety of choices that I think African farmers should have. I, I don't want to take away the heirloom variety, slow food, traditional approach. Uh, I don't want to take that choice away from farmers, but I don't want to, to deny them the other choice either. So there we are. You want them to have the choice of higher yields and the advances in uh, food technology that have fed many more people on much less land, uh, arguably with less inputs and damage to the environment, but that's another argument. Something you just said about all research having to be local and 
economies being local is something you bring out very well in the book when you go often country by country and talk about policies that needed to be applied country by country and got into big trouble when large international organizations were somehow meddling in ways that were not respectful or understanding of those local economies. So you want them to have the choice, and I want them to have the choice to stay local and not be constrained to use new technologies, uh, even if they have the choice, and to be able to preserve their local uh, cultures in ways unimpeded by um, outside political forces and corporate forces, and you're very good on those political forces. So I think we might want to leave it there on so many points we agree on and so many points we agree to disagree on. How's that? Well, uh, I think that's very fair. And let me thank you for obviously having done such a careful and thorough reading of the book. It's it's only been out for a month, and there probably aren't too many people who've read it yet. And uh, if there are, they probably haven't read it as carefully as you have. So uh, that makes every author very happy. Let me give you give me one more chance to hold up the book Please do. in front of our viewing audience. The book is called Food Politics, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's published by Oxford University Press in uh, 2000, in April 2010. So this has been a great conversation. I'm sorry you haven't been able to see me in my kitchen. I haven't been able to see you, but uh, when we get to watch this uh, Blogging Heads broadcast, we'll see each other for the first time. Thank you. And, and then we'll meet, and we'll both look forward to it. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.